Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. You can go take him over to the log there, Chris. In the course of raising animals and having certain ones, sure, I've gotten bit before. You, you can't be in it 50 years and not have had an incident here or there for, for whatever reason it might have been at that time. And generally, it's been my own fault. Here, come here. Easy, ah, ah, easy. See, that's him. He's actually very happy about that. He just wants to play in the worst way. Although this attack was unexpected, for Luke the Lion, this was apparently playtime. See, like that, jumping on me, that was all, he's all happy. But you see how he was stalking in the bushes? He thought, oh, and it's a big game to him. Yeah, it's, it's all him saying hi. He has his claws, but he didn't use them. I mean, because a lot of times, just, just in play, I, 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 you see that? That's hot. You can't go under the trailer. Steve isn't too bothered by the game Luke is playing. He's worked with exotic animals for around 50 years, and he's seen this kind of behavior before. Lions are quite social animals, and within their pride, they are often affectionate with head rubbing, licking, and purring. However, no matter what your experience working with lions, these animals are quick and they are predators with speed on their side. Very, very quick. Say if you were uh, clear at the other end of this pen and he was here, you would never outrun him. He would catch you for sure. I mean, they are extremely fast when they want to be. A lion can run up to 50 miles per hour, but only in short bursts. So they need to be close to their prey before they attack. But generally, lions are a sleepy bunch, and they like to lay around with their pride for around 18 hours a day. They look at us as the dominant member of whatever species. We're talking about lions, so it's lions. They want to do what they do to their fellow lions. We just don't like it when they bite and claw us. So we curtail that. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Chris Edrington works alongside Steve Martin, training animals to work in film and television. This is a job that requires incredible skill, knowing what makes these beasts yes, tick. Easy. He's like a teenage boy. They stretch the limit sometimes. It's the energy you see is a lot of that. By the time they're five or six, they're much more mellow. They might be more mellow as they get older. But getting up close to a lion isn't for the inexperienced. If you didn't know what you were doing, it could be very dangerous. I mean, because he, ah, 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 ah. you got to watch that. He'll jump up and grab it. Oh, he's watching the, the rabbit in the sky. Oh, no, he eventually would jump at it and <laughs> go crunch, crunch. The boom is a great game for Luke. Luke is an experienced animal actor, so the boom is a familiar sight. But Steve knows he needs to keep the boom well away from Luke's reach. This is all part of professional animal training, and Steve Martin is one of the best trainers in the business. 
See, we teach them a mark. It gives them a place to go to. Like if the director said, we need him to come out from behind the bush and come stop there and then run off. We teach him a mark so we can call him to an exact spot. And I tell him, all right. And then Chris would call him off. If you watch uh, a lot of shows, you'd start picking up on that, that, oh, okay, I get it now. Because you see him come up, skid to a stop in an exact spot. Usually it's always a trained behavior to go to that. When it comes to training, it's all about repetition. If you want to train a lion to perform on cue, it needs to be second nature for them. As they get older and as they learn stuff, I, 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 no. Go on, go back on. He wants to rub on me and say hi. As they, uh, as they get older and they learn stuff, they learn how to learn. And where that might have taken us 20 or 30 times of doing it before he goes, oh, oh I, I got what you want now. You notice how he went out and got on it right away? After a while, you get on set and they go, oh, we, can he do this or that? And I said, well, he doesn't really know us. Give us a few minutes. And usually we can get him to do it. Lions have been used in the film industry for many years, from Leo the MGM Lion and the Black and White Era, to a wide variety of blockbusters still being made today. When the lion forgot his lions. Maybe he was tired of retakes, but he suddenly turned on Bigford and gave him a bad mauling. To Bigford, however, it was all in a day's work. Lions have long been associated as the fierce aggressor in popular culture. But there's also a softer, more endearing side as well as being the star of slapstick comedy. In the business we're in, we don't say they're pets, they're working creatures, even though we have a very strong attachment with them and them with us. Usually we always try to get an animal and, and hand raise it, because it's not like getting an animal, oh, this is no good, we'll get rid of him, get another one, yeah, get rid of him. Usually when they come to us, they're here to stay. <laughs> I and mean, we do this as a business, and also, you know, I've been in it, I hate to even admit, since 1967. So I've been in it a lot of years, and you know, we like our animals. We spend a tremendous amount of time. These guys are here every day, seven days a week, and, and uh, I have other trainers too that are very dedicated to all of them. So you build up really strong bonds and relationships with these guys, as you can see. Luke was donated to Steve as a baby from a park in South Carolina. So this young cub has grown up with Steve by his side. This relationship makes it hard to believe that in the wild, a lion can be so dangerous. Oh yeah, he's, he'll be a real good animal. He's, uh, you know, like you can see how excited he is all the time. As he gets older, hopefully the, the excitedness will settle down a little bit <laughs> because I've been gone for three weeks. So this is pretty normal for him to Constantly want to greet you. Oh, I know it's okay. Just relax. Really... No, we'll wait. The relationship between Steve and Luke, like all Steve's animals, is one of great respect. But for Steve, he prides himself on being able to create such a wonderful bond with his movie stars. I'm relaxed, but I'm also aware of what's going on. I mean, there's a lot of people that really think they know what they're doing and don't. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the private sector that do have animals, you know, they get these animals and they raise them as babies and, and they're real rambunctious and, and they think, because my little girl was around it when it was this size, that she can be around it, my daughter, my son, or whatever, when they're full size. It's a whole different mentality. Animals, like humans, grow through varying stages of maturity, playful when young, but when the predator instinct kicks in, these trainers need to be on their game. The cats are a bit more of a predator than a lot of animals. Like bears, for instance, they're not necessarily a real predator like these guys are. And they're a little more intelligent in, in that direction. Where these guys basically, they respond out of you know, contact and, uh, and uh, well, their main drive is being fed for what they're doing. You see what he's doing right now? He's going, he's begging. He says, Chris, Chris, give me a piece. That's it. He's a good boy. Huh? No, quit. 
Juan Stewart is a vet with American Humane, and part of his role is to ensure the safety and well-being of all animal actors. I frequent sets and even the animal companies that provide these dangerous animals to the films. I've had experience and time around a lot of them. You can go back and forth, and you may have a moment where you're with someone who's very experienced, has the expertise, and you would say, I feel safe. I think the people around these animals are safe. And then you'll have a moment with someone else who doesn't have the experience or the wherewithal. And you know immediately that that animal poses a threat, potentially a lethal threat, to that person and the people around them. For Steve and his team of professional animal trainers at Working Wildlife, every animal is special. Whether it's a big cat, chimpanzee, or even a bear, this is one of the top go-to companies for animals in high-end TV commercials and blockbuster movies. For such a setup, being vetted is important for their reputation. The American Humane, we have them come up all the time. They brought somebody from Australia, from New Zealand, and around the world, and they want to see how you handle your animals because they have humane departments throughout the world. And we call them and ask them to come because there are certain groups out there, which I won't say their names, <laughs> but uh, are highly against what we do because they think we starve and beat our animals and all that. So I don't know how you could take an animal you abused on a set with like 200 people and not have it kill you, <laughs> you know? So it's, they're all, it's all a positive reward system in all the training that we do. With so much experience, the working wildlife training is a slick operation. But for the animals, it's often about playtime and fun. They know there's a reward on offer if they hit their mark. These creatures leave it up to the trainers when it comes to the serious side of the business. When we're on set, we usually are pretty strict. Like, I always take three people. Those other two people, they're not just watching what I'm doing. They're watching what's going on. I'm watching exterior things. And sometimes I'll see somebody, like with these guys here, if you had somebody, one person, you got 50 people here and one person out over there like peeking behind a tree or something, they pick up on that right now. And right away you'll see them like this, uh-oh. I said, who's, and you can see them out there. So we try to keep a handle on all exterior stuff that's going on when we're working. One of the stars in the animal lineup is a Kodiak bear named Tag. He's obedient, playful, and likes a crispy treat or two. But when you're working with bears, it's always best to be cautious. Bears can be very dangerous. I mean, under the wrong circumstances. Even though he's real nice, very, uh, he, he's very good about things, very forgiving. No matter what, he's still a bear. You know, you always have to take that into respect. You do the wrong thing and at the right time, and you could you could set them off for one reason or another. So we're, we're very careful about what we do and how we do it. And we've actually had him in houses and various things. And But, you know, we go and check everything out before we are ever going to do a job in certain situations and make sure it's safe for him and for the people. Tag is clearly one of Steve's most beloved bears and he is so switched on that he's worked out it's very much to his advantage to be well behaved in order to get a few extra rewards. He's not real keen on chocolate using. I like that. It's good, it's got peanuts in it. I mean, sometimes I offer him like a chocolate bar and he'll put his nose on it. Yeah. Well, bears are very, very smart and you can teach them a lot of things. One of my favorite is lions. I really like the cats. But these guys are, they have a different intelligent level compared to a cat. A cat's more primitive, where these guys are, the primitiveness isn't as strong in them as it is in the cats. So they're a little smarter. I, th I think they, they definitely think about, if they didn't like somebody, it's always back there in the back of their mind, you know? And if the opportunity arose, they could probably take advantage of it. But you have to be careful because they do have their claws. You know, none of these animals, as you can see, are declawed. 
Tag is so popular, he even travels overseas to take a starring role in the movies. He's very socialized with people. I mean, actually, him, we can work in close proximity. Like, the thing we just did in South Africa is with Johnny Knox and him, and we taught him to drink beer. I mean, it wasn't beer, it was, uh, we put the Dr. Pepper in a beer can. But the two of them are sitting down drinking together, and they high-five each other with their beer. We had two days prep down there and did all the sequences they wanted, so he's a very adaptable bear because he's had so much exposure that he's, when he goes to a new place, he knows it's a, it's a game. Oh, here's my name. Here's your animal cracker. Come on. You're too lazy to get up and get it, though, huh? Bears have different appetites depending upon the time of year. In spring through to summer, they'll eat three to five gallon buckets of food a day. But in the cooler months, it's about a half a bucket. Well, it's, yeah, their whole system slows down this time of year. You're a lazy worker right now, aren't you? It seems Steve has tag well trained. However, these animals all have predator instincts that should never be disregarded. But with safe practice in mind, the working relationship between animal and trainer can be full of rewards. You can see in this guy, he picks up on things real quick. So, you know, at first when we start teaching him, like I said before, it's, it's a, a slower process, but as, as they learn how to learn, they, they kind of, like these bears, they'll just kind of look at you like, oh, okay. And so you pick it up real fast. Shake it, shake it, shake it. Good, good boy. Good boy. The animals are always the number one priority at working wildlife, and Steve has an incredible setup where the animals only spend a small amount of time in their enclosures. On a property this size, the animals get to roam in dedicated open spaces while they prepare for their next starring role. The fear of snakes is one of our most common phobias. But why do we have such an adverse reaction to snakes, even though most of us have never seen one in the wild? Snakes are found on every continent except Antarctica, and there are over 3,600 species slithering across them. Most are non-venomous, but the ones that are venomous can kill, which gives all snakes this bad reputation. However, John Can and his snake-loving family find them irresistible. People are scared of snakes because of the unknown factor. And even when you fully explain it to them, there's no danger if you're careful. They're still got that phobia there, they're concerned. The main thing is you don't try to pick him up, you don't tread near him. A lot of deadly snakes, you can tread near them, they'll escape. A lot of them will put up and, and have a go at you. They're not aggressive, they're defensive. And their defense is being aggressive. Given the deadly reputation of venomous snakes, why is it that snakes are the most common exotic animals kept in captivity? John's unique family story goes some way to answering this. John Can has been living with snakes all his life. The Can family has worked with snakes for almost a hundred years. And John's father, George, took over the snake show at La Perouse from 1920, which is still operating today at the same site in Sydney, Australia. The original show was promoted as the snake pit of death, guaranteed to draw a crowd. John and his brother George Jr. have been extremely close to snakes their whole life. So much so that John is a leading expert and author on the subject of snakes and other exotics. Since his retirement from the snake shows in 2010, John has had more time to concentrate on writing books about these cold-blooded reptiles that have fascinated him since childhood. Dad started when he came back from the First World War. He was still in the Army in uh, February 19. 
come back from France because nobody doing the snake show and he was a snake man by then. So he went and caught a few snakes and set up the pit at the La Perouse. And Mum used to be the Cleopatra. She was the first snake show lady in Tasmania when she was 13. Mum worked on the same showground as Dad and down the track they got married. Whenever Dad was bush, Mum used to do the show at La Perouse. Never with real bad snakes, I can assure you. She probably had pythons and a few black snakes. It's uncommon for exotic pet ownership to cross over many generations. But for John Can, the handling of dangerous snakes is a family tradition. The collection of snakes includes some of Australia's deadliest species. We got most of our snakes from around here, but we used to travel the country a lot when we was getting snakes for milking. We used to go to different lake countries in New South Wales, down into Victoria. But uh, generally speaking, we used to get local snakes. When they weren't using local snakes in the show, John and his dad regularly traveled into the countryside looking for new exhibits to include. When I was a kid, I was in a swamp in Nara one time. I was probably about, I don't know, eight, nine year old. And dad used to always hunt with his trousers that roll up around his legs. And he was in the water where this big black snake was. He was over two meters thicker than your arm. And dad was battling to get that snake in the bag. But he said, pull my trousers down. And before he knew it, I unbuckled his belt and pulled his trousers down here. His trousers were floating in the bloody water. And he didn't see the funny side of it. Later on, he always said, roll me trousers down. <laughs> the diamond python has a stunning skin coloration, which makes it an attractive option as a pet. They can often be found in the roof spaces of houses, an unwelcome surprise for unsuspecting homeowners. The keeping of dangerous snakes is a risk, and yet their popularity as pets is growing worldwide. In the wild, snakes avoid humans, whereas in captivity, they spend a lot of time being handled. But are all snakes the same? Is it possible to completely tame a snake? They all have their own temperament whatever mood they're in, but some of our deadlier snakes do quieten down in captivity after a time, and people, on my opinion, carelessly put the venomous snakes around their neck, and as I photographed in one of my book, a friend of mine kissing a tiger snake, and that's the snake that killed him. So you can never be certain they're not going to bite even when they're quiet. I have had friends of mine in comas for weeks and weeks after a spitten by a snake, they reckon would never ever bite them. So. Rob, who is one of the current snake handlers at La Perouse, also works as a professional snake catcher and knows what's required to safely manage these reptiles. The experience of being bitten by a snake can sometimes be uh, a good lesson. Best avoided, but I have been bitten by venomous snakes. Out of thousands of snake species, that are many of them are harmless, I could have been bitten by many harmless species. But I think what people are trying to ask is, have you been bitten by venomous snakes? And the answer is, yes. I'd, it'd be sort of weird if you hadn't, in a way, to be so involved with snakes and never actually experience that part of, and I don't recommend it in any way. Don't go and get yourself bitten by a snake. Our only highly venomous ambush predator is this historical snake. But it's got the worst name of any snake in history. This snake is called the Death Adder. One of the fastest striking snakes in the world. And they are quite venomous if you measure the toxicity of their venom. And the best way I can describe 
how venomous a death adder is, is by how many people used to die from its bite. The death rate from death adder bite before the invention of anti-venom was apparently 50% fatality rate before the invention of anti-venom. Even when you're an expert with snakes, it must be remembered you could be dealing with a venomous snake that won't hesitate to bite if they feel threatened. John's dad survived the ordeal of being bitten by a tiger snake. He had a very bad bite from a big tiger snake on the, on the ankle there, and the snake really hung on and gave him a lot of venom, and all he did was say to his friend who was with him at the time, don't tell the missus about it, you know? But she knew, she could see the look on his face that he was, he was bitten. But that bite would have killed a normal person, I would say, it could have been within 10 minutes, it could be an hour or two. But it was a bad bite from a big cranky snake. Tiger snakes, one of the world's deadliest snakes, are highly venomous and found in subtropical and temperate regions of Australia. Tiger snakes are dangerous, but people do keep them as pets. They appear intimidating and fearsome, but it is mostly a bluff. Experts will say that you do need a high level of experience in snake handling before you even think about keeping a venomous species. Is a snake recommended as an ideal pet? As with most exotic animals, it requires a special kind of person that's prepared to provide the right environment for them to live in. But unlike a domestic cat or dog, a snake will never come looking for any affection from its human. If you like snakes, that's the only way you can call them a pet. They will say, they'll never get to know you. A lot of people get the impression that snakes do know you, I don't believe it. They'll I'll come to you when you open their cage or their door or whatever. They think you're going to supply them with food. Some snakes will bite you when they're really hungry uh, by mistake, but soon let you go. We're talking about non-venomous snakes. But generally speaking, they make a good pet, you know, as long as you can look after them properly and you've got the right facilities to do so. Yeah, I would definitely say snakes make good pets. Depends on who you are but they're more catered to somebody who has an interest in natural history. See, a dog or a cat is for people who just need something and it has to do something for them. With a reptile, especially a snake, it's more of an interesting creature from a scientific point of view. They're interesting in their reproductive biology, in their behavior. They're low maintenance. So they, they actually make quite good pets. John Cant is a responsible owner with an enormous amount of experience. He has always been around snakes and other exotics. And in some way, this has definitely enhanced his lifestyle. Snakes evoke fear, but for John, they are a constant joy and a pet that in most cases are easily handled. Knowing how to handle a snake properly is important. Allowing them to move freely is recommended as it will soon let you know if it isn't comfortable. You never restrict their movement. If I stopped him from moving, he would get cranky about it. Maybe not bite me. If I held it long enough, he probably might. I don't know, I'm not gonna try it out. But irrespective of that, you never restrict a snake from moving unless it's a venomous snake and you got him by the tail and you're trying to keep his head away from you, you hold him by the body. But um, as a so-called pet or that python, you don't, don't restrict their movements. John's diamond python is from the python family, which are non-venomous and known as constrictors. Tightening slowly around their victim, constrictors coil their body around the prey until they are suffocated and ready to consume.
pythons can swallow prey bigger than the diameter of their own heads, which broadens the possibilities of a hearty meal. The snake pit at La Perouse provides the opportunity for the public to get up close and personal with some of Australia's deadliest snakes in a controlled environment. Rob recalls the impact his snakes have on the public that come to see the shows. People react here to snakes a lot better than they do when it's in their house. The snake in a snake show is always, people react to it much better because it's in a controlled situation. Uh, and there's a snake handler there. If you bring the snake over to the wall to show them, they step backwards at the same rate. And some people even scream uh, when the snake heads in their direction. So the people are as highly variable as the snakes are. Well, they're all very curious. I often used to get the impression at times when people are a bit disappointed you never got bitten, <laughs> which is probably could have been true. I, I, I like to think I was wrong, but they're interested on the educational aspect of it. The shows at La Perouse have been entertaining people for generations. These days, the shows educate people about some of Australia's deadliest snakes that are kept safely tucked away in bags at the snake pit waiting for their turn to draw gas from the spectators. As each snake is displayed, Rob explains the characteristics of the species and exposes some common misconceptions about snakes. Safety is always top of mind when working with these reptiles. And even though he knows their behaviors well, there's always the slim chance he could get bitten. They have to be respected at all times. But as far as John is concerned, a lifetime's fascination with snakes proves that even this misunderstood and often feared predator can become a unique part of the family. Just don't expect them to fetch a ball. Australia's largest island, Tasmania, is home to some of the world's strangest animals. And sadly, it's best known for the demise of the most well-known marsupial, the Tasmanian tiger. Extinct since the 1930s, it may come as a surprise that they were once kept as pets, but even this could not guarantee the species' survival. The debate around exotic animals as pets is now centered on the other recognizable Tasmanian animal, the Tassie Devil. The keeping of native animals in Australia is a hot topic, but maybe the best opinion on this comes from someone who works with the devils every day. Alicia looks after a colony of devils, and one in particular is young Hurricane. This here is baby Hurricane. He is a Tasmanian devil. He's approximately five months old, we believe. Um, so he is being hand raised by me at the moment. So he comes to work with me every single day and then when I go home at night, he comes with me as well. He's being bottle fed around five to six times a day every four to five hours. So uh, he needs constant care, constant warmth. He's got a little hutch that he lives in when he's at home with me, which has a heat pad and, and lots of blankets and, and soft toys and things in there for him as well. Hurricane is cute, but Alicia does know that his bite is as bad as his squeal. Tasmanian devils actually have the strongest jaw of any animal relative to their size. The second strongest jaw belongs to the tiger. Therefore, pound for pound, Tassie devils can actually bite you harder than a tiger. 
an average adult male weighs in at around 18 pounds. Its muscular build and strong jaws mean it can tear into wombats weighing up to 65 pounds. You pop him down on the ground and it's natural instinct for him to want to chase you. So what he'll do is he'll chase me for as long as he needs in order to, to find my leg and climb back up my body. So he comes home with me and, and terrorises my living room. <laughs> he likes to intimidate you. So that's Tasmanian's devil's game, basically. They like to open their mouth wide and show you their big teeth. They like to make really terrifying noises in front of your face. He likes to approach and likes to try to scare you out of his territory if he doesn't want you to be in there. If he does bite you, it's going to hurt <laughs> and it's probably going to scar as well. So you need to watch those signs really carefully and make sure that you are safe while you're in there. Devils could be good pets. Their size, the sleeping habits and what they eat is similar to that of a pet dog. But unlike dogs, when Hurricane reaches sexual maturity, a different approach is needed. He's going to be fine for at least two years until sexual maturity kicks in. And, and then he's not going to be aggressive. He's just not going to be friendly anymore. So I would not be able to hold him up like a baby with his face next to mine and feel confident um, that there isn't a chance that he would bite me. Once sexual maturity kicks in, he, he turns back into a, a wild sort of devil and um, his sexual instincts kick in and, and that becomes his main priority. If I enter an enclosure where a female is or where he can smell a female, then I then become a threat to his chances to having that female and he does become a little bit more aggressive and, and will want to remove you from his enclosure. I actually hand raised Hurricane's mum and dad, so I was comfortable with them for a long time. His dad was very comfortable with me until sexual maturity hit uh, at around two and a half years old. I could still pick him up, he'd climb up my leg and, and be happy to have a cuddle, um, just like your friendly dogs and cats at home, until about two, two and a half years old. And then once he started to feel like a, a big boy, it became very unsafe to go in with him then. So that's his natural instinct, he wants to grab on. I have a little bit of arm in there, <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty painful. It's like a vice-like grip at the moment. Um, he doesn't want mum to leave him behind in the wild, so he needs to latch on with all his might. Uh, obviously, if another animal wants to come by and eat him, uh, they're gonna wanna pull as hard as they can to get him off mum's back. So uh, once he latches onto something, there's a vice-like grip there. Um, so if he gets my finger or if he gets my arm, you just gotta leave it there until he's done, basically. <laughs> There's little doubt that a tight grip could cause serious injury. The devil's bite force is an obvious deterrent to human contact. It's less damaging, but when they're adults, you definitely don't want them to bite you. So you're always watching their behavior to make sure that they're not showing any aggressive signs like that. As adults, if they were to bite you, it's usually just a warning bite. They'll bite you in an attempt to scare you and then they're going to let go straight away. So they're not going to hold on, uh, which is wonderful because otherwise you could end up with some broken bones depending on where they were biting you if they really wanted to. Welding gloves is one good thing that you should always be wearing if you are going to have to handle the devil. It's not going to help you too much, um, but it's going to help a little bit. Holding them at the base of their tail is the safest place if you can get to it. Although it's illegal to own any endangered native Australian animals, it's more the Tasmanian devil's temperament that protects it from private animal ownership. Usually people do try to push the boundaries with things like that. Probably people are a little bit too scared with Tasmanian devils. Tasmanian devils tend to have a really bad name. They'll stand in front of you, they'll open their mouth really wide and they, and they want to try to intimidate you. Oh. People will tend to see that sort of behaviour and, and tend to think, I don't want to go anywhere near that Tassie Devil, so I don't think anyone really even wants to have them as pets, which is good. Sure, yeah, so Tasmanian Devils, of course, you cannot have them as a pet. Uh, you can't have any native wildlife as a pet. The Australian government just does not allow you to do that. It encourages then people to illegally take those animals out of the wild, which you want to decourage, of course. So Tasmanian Devils especially you cannot have. They're an endangered species. 
they're quite a tricky species to look after and they're dangerous as well. So if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know those warning signs as they get older, a lot of damage can be done um, to yourself, younger children, other animals and things like that as well. Some believe that devils could be taught not to be so aggressive and be as calm and domesticated as a family pet. Twinkle was one such pet. She lived with her owner, Mike Jago, for many years. Her behavior was perfect, up until just after her first birthday. Mike came home one day to find Twinkle had destroyed his leather lounge. When the thylacine died out, the Tasmanian devil took over the title of the largest known carnivorous marsupial. But where the thylacine's relatively docile nature made it suitable as a domestic pet, even hand-reared devils are far from safe to be around. Some experts say that had devils been domesticated for generations, they may have become more predictable and better behaved. Domestication may also help in saving the species. It is estimated that 90% of all devils in the wild are affected by an aggressive cancer which is threatening their existence. Many believe we are witnessing the demise of a species and that captive animals may be the only way forward. Private ownership may still be a possible solution to the conservation of other species but the issue remains contentious. Is domestication really a viable solution? In some states here in America, it is outright legal to own just about anything, but that doesn't make it okay, and it doesn't make it beneficial to the animal. Just because it's legal doesn't make it right, and we know that. You know, animal ownership is certainly uh, you know, underscores that, and it, it's an evolution, you know? The understanding of the care, uh, the welfare that goes into a lot of these animals, it's an evolution and it takes time. Tigers and lions, for example, have been successfully bred in captivity, but none have ever been reintroduced to the wild. To save cats, you've got to have that entire ecosystem intact. Any part of that food chain is out and the cats are going to die. So uh, keeping animals in their own habitat is by far the, the best way. Alicia and Hurricane have formed a bond that may just be a positive sign for this much maligned species. I'm mum to him now, yep. So he knows my scent. Um, he's pretty happy to be hand raised by me if somebody else has to give him a bottle uh, for any reason, just for one of those times. He tends to be a little bit more frustrating because uh, it's a different smells to him. Um, obviously everyone has a little bit of a different technique as well. So he prefers consistency. He likes to be hand raised by only one person. Uh, it does work best for him um, in order for him to, to grow and develop as he's supposed to. I feel like I'm really, really lucky. Tasmanian devils are obviously an endangered species, so being able to work so closely with a species that's so special and so unique um, is really awesome. And also working with them, you know, you're actually doing something to help them in the wild as well. So um, I also help run the Devils in Danger Foundation. So Hurricane will be an ambassador species for, for that foundation, encourage people to fall in love with him um, and Tasmanian devils in general, which is going to, of course, encourage people to want to donate and to want to help save them in the wild. It's really, really important to let people see them and, and gain such an appreciation for a really special species that people tend to overlook a lot of the time.